what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads with me a moment? Master, we love you so much, and we're so grateful every time for uh, the opportunity to come into the house of God to receive from your word. For in its pages, God, tonight, are life and breath to our spirit and to our being. Master, we ask that your anointing would rest upon us. Lord, that you would help us to glean from this uh, message that you've laid upon my heart, everything you want us to glean this hour. Let not one thing go unattended to. Master, let not one thought be unspoken, but rather, God, let everything be conveyed that you desire to convey tonight. For, Lord, tonight it's our desire to be a better believer, to be a better Christian as we leave this place than when we came in. We ask tonight, God, for your divine assistance in this endeavor, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated tonight. I know that when you, kind of like this morning, I pulled the text out of the context of Revelation chapter 3. This morning I pulled a text out of the context of John chapter 3. And if you don't follow how Brother Morrow preaches, I'm not the kind of preacher generally that goes verse by verse and just helps to reinterpret and reapply the uh, verse by verse, you know, exegesis as it were. I don't do that. I'll tell you honestly, most believers, most Christians read their Bibles. And if you can read, unless there's something desperately wrong with you, you can get as much out of reading it as the pastor getting up and breaking it down to you verse by verse and word by word. But I think a lot of times that what happens is in the course of a certain context of Scripture verses, God is trying to convey some very important truths and I think that while we may understand word for word what it's saying a lot of times we're missing the truth that God's wanting us to get from the whole thing in context so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll read the text and if you think about the message that I've just preached and you'll look back at the text that I gave you, you'll realize that what I've done is I have just pulled the truth right out of that con out of that text and then proceeded to expound upon it directly and just go right on by all the verse by verse messages. We're not gonna go into all that. Normally when you hear somebody preach on Revelation chapter 3, the Laodicean church, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And we talk about false security. And we talk about people believing that they have something in God when God, in fact, doesn't believe they have anything at all. A lot of times when we read this portion of Scripture, we're drawn to his, uh, the Lord's comments. I would that you were either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I spew you out of my mouth. And we're accustomed to immediately the preacher kind of hews in on these catchphrases. He kind of hews in on these important statements. But there's something that goes so far beyond the catchphrase to be found in this portion of Scripture that it's not even funny. And when I tell you the title of my message tonight, you're going to say, where did he get that? Did he get that out of this text? Does this, does this title have anything to do with this text? But I believe by the end of the evening you'll see that it does. I want to talk to us tonight on the topic of, can you see God's lips moving? Can you see God's lips moving? How did this portion of scripture that I read to you tonight, how did it end? It ended with a statement, let him that hath ears let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So obviously we're understanding that the Lord is saying, I'm trying to talk to the church, but is anybody listening? You see, we fail to recognize sometimes that when God speaks to us, when God speaks to the church, when God speaks to his people, he frequently speaks through a variety of means. Sometimes he speaks through the preacher while he's preaching, doesn't he? Amen. Because you hear something and it pricks you in the heart and you know, hey, that, that says something to me. 
God's trying to tell me something. Can you see God's lips moving? There's a very popular form of entertainment many years ago that used to exist that was known as ventriloquism. The ventriloquist uh, was an individual who was able to manipulate a puppet and make it seemingly come to life by putting words into its mouth without the audience ever seeing the puppeteer's lips move. That's what a ventriloquist does, right? He got that little dummy, and he says, I'm on his arm. Oh, hello, Freddy. Hello, Joey. And the key to a good ventriloquist act is, you don't see the lips of the guy who's operating the puppet. You don't see his lips move. You want to be made to believe that that little wooden and cloth puppet is a living, breathing creature, don't you? You want the illusion that that little puppet is real, has a mind of its own. You don't want to be reminded of the fact that that puppet couldn't say a word if that puppeteer wasn't holding him. Amen. That's a good ventriloquist, isn't it? Charlie McCarthy and Mr. Bergen. You remember the ventriloquist? Candace Bergen's dad and the puppet Charlie McCarthy, right? He was a famous ventriloquist back in the 1950s and 60s. All right. He was well loved. Everybody loved his act. But why did they love his act? Because you couldn't see his lips move. When he had a little puppet character on his arm, he could make you believe that that puppet character had a mind of its own. He can make you believe that puppet character had a thoughts of its own. He can make you believe that puppet character had a voice of its own. He can make you believe that that puppet character had a sense of humor that was all its own. Am I right now? Yes. And it was all because you could not see the puppeteer's lips moving, the ventriloquist's lips moving. Well, I want you to know tonight, God speaks to us through a variety of ways this evening. He speaks to his people in many, many uh, different types of ways and fashion. But I want you to know that it's imperative today that we learn to see God's lips moving so that when somebody's talking and they claim to be the dummy sitting on God's arm, we know whether in fact they are or they're not. Come on now. I'll tell you, when a preacher gets up in a pulpit and begins to preach some hateful, violent, ugly garbage, I can tell you right now, I don't see my God's lips moving. You may be talking, dummy, but God isn't talking. Amen. You're following me tonight. You may be saying something, but I assure you, it's not originating with God, it's originating with you. But then also there are other times, Mother, that God will speak to us, and we won't like the way he spoke. I've had people come to me, the Lord spoke to me to tell you something. I didn't like that person, never did, never will. Really didn't care much for anything they had to say. I, one particular instance that I'm going to tell you all about tonight is when I was a young person and my Uncle Stephen, bless his heart, <laughs> came to me. A young girl from church had just come to me and said something about they were opening a skating rink in Naugatuck, Connecticut, where the church I grew up was in Naugatuck, Connecticut. And she was telling me, oh, Chuck, they're opening a skating rink here in Alcatraz, Connecticut. And as a kid growing up, I used to emulate my father in one particular way. I'm ashamed to admit it now, but I used to do this all the time. My father was a negative. He was unsaved. He was uncouth. He was negative. Uh, everything you said to him, he had something negative to say back to you. And not realizing this, I was doing the same thing. Every time somebody would come to me and say anything, I would throw something negative back at them, and I didn't realize I was doing this. And that is not conduct becoming a child of God. Amen? 
God's people shouldn't be so filled with negativity that the only thing people can count on you to say is something negative and contrary to faith. Come on now. So I turned around and this girl, Barbara Rex, you remember Barbara Rex, she called her all to put the skating rink here in town. And I began to spew the same garbage that I had heard my father say when somebody talked to him about this rink coming into town. Well, you know what you get when you get a rose game rank. Next thing you know, you're going to have organized crime, and you're going to have all kinds of kids hanging out and loitering, and it's going to be problematic, and it'll be the worst thing that ever hit town, and blah, blah, blah. Now, it's only maybe 11 or 12 tops at this time. Well, Barbara looked like I just smacked her in the head with a baseball bat. And she just turned around and walked away, just looked deflated. Like, oh, well, I tried to talk to him about something, and he just, you know, shot it right out of the air. Looking back, I could see her reaction. See, then I didn't see it. But looking back, I, I see that reaction. My Uncle Stephen was standing nearby. Stephen and I never got along real well. I don't know why, to be honest. I really don't. But we, we just never clicked real well. If there was anybody in this world I wanted advice from, it wasn't Stephen. Amen. If there was anybody in this world that I thought God could speak through, it wasn't Stephen. Stephen comes over to me. Doggone it, Chuck. I'll never forget it. He was famous for doggone it. Doggone it, Chuck. No wonder you don't have any close friends. Look at the way you do. The girl, all she did was come over and say something to you about they're putting in a skating rink, and she's excited about it because she's looking at it like it's a, a, a place to, for the church kids to go and have a good time. You maybe, won't, maybe you won't hang out there every weekend like the, the kids in the world will, but you know it'll be a place for the church kids to go every once in a while and have a church event, and y'all can have a good time, and it'll be nice to have one in town instead of having one somewhere else. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to hear from Stephen. Stephen had nothing to say I cared about hearing. But I went home, and I thought about what he said, because it was more important to me than my testimony be what it's supposed to be, than it was that somebody I didn't really care about all that much or somebody I didn't like as much as the next guy was the one that God used to set me correct. You're following me now. See, I don't care what the dummy looks like God's speaking through. As long as I can see God's lips moving, I'm going to listen. You're hearing me now. And I realized, Lord, I don't like the idea that Stephen told me that and said that. But you know what? Upon further investigation, the more I think about it, I can't say Stephen's wrong. Oh, God, I don't want to be like that, Lord. Please, Lord Jesus, I don't want to be like my father. I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be, oh, God, what can I do? And you know what? You present God with a problem, and I promise you, oh, glory, he'll present you with an answer. You show God a dilemma, and he'll show you a way out of your dilemma. I said, Lord, I don't want to be like that. I don't, I don't want to resemble my father in that area. What can I do, God, to be different? And the Lord, as clear as bell, spoke to me and said, here's the way to break yourself out of that habit, because by now it's become a habit. So you saw it, you learned it from your parents, your, your dad, but now it's become a habit. He said, well, here's the way to break a habit like that. Don't just try to stop doing that, because if you try to stop doing that, all you're going to do is be constantly aware of the fact that you're doing it. You ever try to stop doing something? And all you, yeah, eating, right, drinking, smoking, and what happens is every time you want to smoke, you become violently aware of the fact you want to smoke. It's like all of a sudden, the fact that you want to have a cigarette is, is on a billboard in front of your face, whereas in the past, when you just allowed yourself to smoke, you didn't think about whether or not you wanted to have it. You're following my logic. The Lord said you can't just Try to stop doing it, because if you do that, you're just going to be aware all the time that you're doing it. You're 
you're going to wind up slipping and doing it, and they say, oh, God, help me, I should have stopped. And then they say, oh, I should have, I didn't want to say that. He said, don't do that. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make up your mind that every time you see somebody, before you ever have a thought about them, before you even have a chance to think anything negative, before you even have a chance, he said, I want you to look for something positive. I want you to look for something nice. I want you to look for something that is deserving of a compliment. And I want you to compliment them. You know how you can sit and some lady come to the grocery store wearing this big whacked out hairstyle? And y'all turn to one another and say, Oh, Lord, she could grow a nest full of birds up in that thing, could she? <laughs> you know? You know how you do that? You know how you're just getting tacky, you know? Sometimes you just get a little bit picky, and you know you start making a little comment. Well, all of a sudden, I found myself, here comes this big old ugly buck tooth one-eyed woman, Stock and roll down to her ankles. Ugliest dress that ever was made. Walk in the store, you know. And, and she'd say, well, hello there. How are you? And I'd say, well, you know what, honey? I just have to tell you, you've got one of the most bloated voices I've ever heard. That was the only thing I could find a compliment on. But I found something. And by looking for something positive and verbalizing something positive, what it helped me to do was it helped me to push out the habit of speaking the negative and replace it with a habit of speaking the positive. You following me? So instead of just trying to stop doing one thing, instead I replaced it by doing something else that was constructive and positive. All of a sudden I got to a point where, good God Almighty, I can't go anywhere, but then I've got to compliment people. I've got to compliment babies. I've got to tell a girl she's pretty. I've got to tell a man he's handsome. I've got to tell him I like his tie. I've got to tell him I like his suit. I've got to tell him I like his shoes. I've got to tell her I like her dress. I've got to tell her I like the color of her dress. It doesn't matter, but I'm going to speak something positive if it kills me. Because I'd rather be known as someone who compliments and builds up than someone who condemns and criticizes and tears down. Amen? Now, you know what? That was years ago that Stephen told me that. And I thank God that I was more concerned with the fact that I saw God's lips move than concerned about who he was speaking through. A lot of times we could benefit in our lives deeply because God's trying to speak to us in many, many different settings, many different situations, but we're not listening because we find fault with the messenger or we don't like they, the way they presented the message. But I've got news for you, children. If we can ever get to the place in our lives where we stop looking at the messenger and we stop looking at the way that the message is presented, and if we could ever start looking at it and saying, could that have been God? Hello? Could that have been God speaking through? my son or my daughter. Could that have been God speaking through my brother or my sister or my cousin or my uncle? Could that have been God speaking through the pastor? Could that have been God speaking through the preacher? Did I see God's lips move when that person said what they said? Oh, I tell you, this is an important lesson to learn tonight because Jesus said, let him that hath ears, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. But how do we know what the Spirit's saying? How do we know when it was the Spirit that spoke and it wasn't just the man that was delivering the message who did the speaking? Well, I'll tell you how we'll know. Come on now. We're going to read it right now. <laughs> As it was in the days of Moses leading the people of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt, so it is with the church today. More important than it has ever been, it is incumbent upon us to learn to recognize if and when the Lord is genuinely speaking 
or if the doll is attempting to speak on behalf of its creator. Amen. More important than the messenger today is the validity of his or her message. Can you see God's lips moving even as you hear this message being preached to you tonight? Amen. Can you see God's lips moving? Do you realize that God's trying to tell you something? Amen. In John chapter 3, verses 26 through 31, And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizer, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear witness bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy is therefore fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. What was John saying? The message is far more important than the messenger. I am only here as a pre-runner, a forerunner for the Messiah. I'm not the Messiah, but I'm here to announce the arrival of Messiah. He must increase. I must decrease. The messenger is not nearly as important as the message. Amen. The word that I'm preaching tonight is far more important, my friend, than the fact that I'm preaching it. Amen. If I never get one ounce of credit, and I won't, <laughs> if I never get one ounce of recognition, if I never get one minute of television time, if I never get one iota of praise for the message and the word that I preach, if it affects a change in your life, that helps you to be a better child of God. If I affect a change in your life, that helps you to find faith, to believe God in the hard times. If I somehow affect a change in your life, that will ensure you an eternity in the presence of God. Then it doesn't matter who said it. Hallelujah. Amen. It doesn't matter that I said it or who said it. And I've got news for you. When this preacher says what I just said, I mean every word of it. You can't get up and preach week after week with just a few folks and have lost as many folks as we lost in the last couple of months and gone through the experiences we've gone through. And I've been in ministry a long time and I've never experienced what we experienced in this last few months. But you know what? I keep preaching. Why? Because it's not about me. It's about the message. Hallelujah. It's not about me. It's about people who are going to get a tape of this message who need to hear what we've got to say. I can let my ego be bruised and say, well, there are enough people here for me to even bother preaching to. But you know what? No matter how many people there are in this room, if I'll just preach the word, if I'll just do the job God's called me to do, I've got news for you. God will see to it that the message gets out. I may not ever go anywhere. Brother Joaquin, I may never get to Norway, but I'm preaching in Norway right now. Hallelujah. I may never get to Germany, but honey, somebody in Germany is listening to our tape right now. I may never see the other side of this planet, but honey, the message that I'm preaching is going to reach around the world. So what's important, me or the message? The message. Amen. Can you see God's lips moving? Amen. You see, it's not just important to understand that God can speak to you through the preacher. It's also important to understand that God can speak to you through any one of, of a million means outside of the preacher. Amen. The Lord can speak in many, many, many different ways. And it's imperative that we learn to look for God's lips to be moving. I don't like what that person said. But you know what? What they said... 
They may have said it so nasty that it made your hair turn green. They may have cussed you every which way but upside down. But is what they said malicious and mean and nasty or is what they said, if you were to take and think about what they said and apply it to your life, would it help you? Amen. Did, have you ever have you ever heard somebody say something to you and you just hated the way they said it? But when you thought about what they said, you realized that in the bottom line, they were trying to help you, not hurt you. Oh, they might have cussed you till their tongue turned orange. They might have just said everything the wrong way. But you know what? They got their message across. I got news for you. Sometimes God will use a medium that you would say, Oh, no, God can never use that. God will never use that. But you know what? If, if, if that person's saying it the way they said it, finally stopped you in your tracks and got you to listen and pay attention, look for God's lips to be moving. Because it just might very well be that if God tried to tell you a thousand times before in nicer, sweeter, kinder, gentler ways, and you wasn't listening then either. Oh, my Lord, did I say that? Amen. Look for God's lips to be moving. Maybe he's using that hard, mean, ugly criticism or critique or whatever you want to call it. Maybe he's using that to try to tell you something. And if we're going to be a child of God, we've got to learn to hear when the Spirit's speaking. We've got to learn to hear when God's trying to talk to us. Regardless of how he's trying to talk to us. Regardless of who he's trying to talk to us through. Or how the person he's trying to talk to us through is saying it. Amen? The test is simple. When God speaks, it will be constructive. It's for your betterment. It's for you to be a better person. It's for you to be a better believer. It's for you to be a better human being. It's for you to have a better frame of mind. It's for you to have a better spiritual condition. It's for you to have a better emotional condition. That doesn't mean the message might not come out all kind of cross-eyed backwards and upside down. But if that's the intent of the message, my Grandpa Bell, bless his heart, my grandfather Bell was not a great communicator like me. <laughs> now watch that laugh in there, woman. He wasn't a great communicator like me, so to speak. Sometimes, you know, you do something and he'll come at you like a rabid dog. And oh, he would cuss till the air turned blue. But you know, as the years went by, I heard him do this many, many, many different times with different people. And of course, my grandmother was frequently on the receiving end of the, the blue breath. And I realized after a while, you know what, though? If you listen to what the man was saying, he didn't say it very nice. But if you listen to what he was saying, it was actually constructed. It actually would have helped you to be a better person, to, to, to listen to what he was saying. If you just thought about what he was saying and applied what he was saying, it would have helped you and I. The Lord said, that's why. Whether we like it or we don't, whether it pinches or it doesn't, when we hear something that we can appreciate or we don't hear something we can appreciate, the, the, the litmus test needs to be, can I see God's lips moving? Lord, are you trying to tell me something? Is that you, Lord? I think I could have sworn I saw your lips moving while this dummy over here was saying what it was saying. I didn't like what he had to say, but Lord, I could have swore I saw your lips moving. Which means it was the Spirit of the Lord that was trying to talk to us. And not just that dummy that's sitting on his knee. Amen. John chapter 10, verses 24 through 33. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you. And ye believe not. Well, what must he have told them? He must have said he was, because the Lord said, but you didn't believe me. 
He said, The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice. There's a lot of people out there today, I'll tell you, call themselves Christians. The preacher can get up and preach till he drops to the floor dead, and they've never heard from God. Amen. Well, the pastor can try to advise them and counsel them. You know what? He can do that till they have heart attack, and they'll never have heard from God. You know why? Because they don't know God's voice when they hear it. He said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father, for which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered and saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. I just wanted to read that for anybody who had any questions as to who the Jews thought Jesus said he was. Amen. <laughs> Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. You know what? A shepherd can yell and sound so mean and so malicious and so horrible and so terrible that his sheep run in one direction or the other, and he may be yelling like that to avoid them running over the edge of a cliff. Amen. He doesn't just go, take your bell, woo-hoo, coco, tee. Y'all come on this way. Come on now. No, no. He may, he may decide for whatever reason that his only reaction, his only response, the only amount of time he has for a response at this point is that he goes, <laughs> and in so doing, he scares them into a new direction, helping to avoid the cliff that they're headed toward. Sometimes when God's trying to direct us, my friend, it's not always about God sitting there and gently, kindly leading us along. Well, now, let me explain this to you. Here's how it works. Da, 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 da. No, sometimes you can get slapped upside the head. Amen. Sometimes, sometimes it's, you're going to get wham, whacked. Don't take offense. Don't take offense. Look to see if God's lips are moving. Lord, are you trying to talk to me? Because if you are, then I need to be listening. You remember our primary text tonight in Revelation chapter 3? The Lord said, I chasten those whom I love. Part of what you may hear sometimes may be chastisement. Part of what you may hear sometimes may be, you know, may be rough to the hearing. But it's just as important that we hear it. Whether we like it or we don't. And you know, I'm going to tell you, as a pastor, I think that... I think any man or woman that is a sincere person of God seeking to serve in ministry, I think we are so much more susceptible to, I think this is one of the reasons that God calls us to preach, because I recognize God's voice in a lot of things that other people wouldn't recognize His voice in, even when it comes from my worst enemy even when it comes from somebody I utterly despise, even when it's coming from a source that I would so much rather it not be coming from, if what they are saying is going to help me, then I recognize it as God's lips are moving. This person isn't just talking on their own, but God is speaking through them. You remember the story in the scripture where God spoke through an ass? Spoke through a donkey, you remember? I mean, if God can speak through a donkey, God can speak through just about anything or anybody, can he? If that's what it's going to take to get the point across to us sometimes, to communicate to us in a way that we're going to hear it and listen. Okay, I'm almost done. Tommy teases me because I say that and then I go on for 20 minutes. But no, I'm almost done tonight. I want you to know tonight, according to Revelation 19, 9 and 10, and he saith unto me, Write, 
Blessed are they which are called unto the merit supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. What is the spirit of prophecy? The spirit of prophecy is God himself speaking in the first person through his servant. Whenever the Spirit of the Lord is speaking, he shall be extolling the wonders of our Christ and the glory of his resurrection power. He will never contradict his word, but he will instead illuminate it for us in ways which we might never before have imagined. God only speaks in constructive terms, but this does not mean that his words are always soft and pleasant to hear. So in other words, you've got to get past the way it sounds and get to the heart of it what, what's being said. As we struggle to be all that God has called us to be, the enemy of our soul will frequently attempt to get us to discredit the messenger or find fault with the manner in which the message was delivered. But does it really matter? After all, is not the final word and litmus test in any message simply that we can see God's lips moving? even as we hear the messenger speak the message. In closing tonight, 1 Kings 19, 11 and 12, And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And that's when Jeremiah finally heard from God. When the prophet finally heard from God was when he got down past all the things he would have thought God would have spoken to him through. Amen. Well, I would have thought God would speak to me through the preacher. Well, maybe he will, maybe he won't. He may use an unsaved neighbor to say something to you that will cut you right down to your shoes. And you'll hate them for saying it. But if you'll look and see where God's lips moving, because if they were, that may be the best thing that person could ever have done for you. They may have helped you in a way like you've never been helped. Because if God can use an ass to speak to a man, if God can use a wind, if God can use an earthquake, if God can use a fire, if God can use a still, small voice, God can use just about anything, can he? Amen. To speak to us. The Lord does not always speak to us as we might imagine he will. Yes, he may choose to use a sermon, such as we've heard tonight, or a message on the television or radio, but he may also use what would appear almost uh, obviously not to be like him at all. He may speak in a way, and you'll and you say, but God would never speak to me in that way. But that's exactly what he's doing. So tonight I encourage you in this. When you hear something, like it or love it, hate it or lump it, look upward, see real quick if you can catch the Lord's lips moving. Because just maybe what you've heard was for your benefit. And even though it might not have sounded good the way it was said or who said it, you might not have liked. But you know what? Just look up and see if God's lips are moving. Because, honey, there may be something in there that will help you. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me tonight?